This is the eleventh message in a series on prophecy. And this is the fifth message from First Thessalonians 4. And if your Bible's getting like mine, it should be falling open at that passage now. I noticed this morning that it fell open easily to First Thessalonians 4. And you should know by memory verses 13 through 18 because I've been reading them at the beginning of each message. And I'm going to read them again this morning. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 18. Our subject is the rapture, the translation, or the catching away of the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm sorry, I can't go back and review the ten previous messages. But we must start at verse 13 again and finish this passage this morning that on this coming Wednesday night we might deal with the subject, When is Jesus Coming? So I hope you'll be on hand for that meeting. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep by Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. Jesus came to earth from heaven. The Bible is very clear and very plain on the great subject of the deity of Christ. He was no mere human being. He was the very Son of the living God. Mysterious as it may seem to all of us, he was very God of very God and took upon himself for a short span of time the outward likeness or appearance to man. It is recorded in the Bible how he was not made in the likeness of an angel, but for a short season made lower than the angels, that he might be crowned with suffering and death and by the grace of God, taste death for every man. The human race in Adam is depraved, corruptible, unholy and unrighteous, and never by their efforts or by their own attainments could they ever meet the standards of God's righteousness. However, God loved the world, and so he sent Jesus, his beloved Son, into the world to take upon himself the likeness of man, that he might so identify himself with the human race, that he might become their sin-bearer at the cross of Calvary. When Jesus went to Calvary, he went as a true substitute for every man. This is the gospel the Bible preaches, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised again the third day, according to the scriptures. The Bible declares emphatically that when the Lord Jesus died, he died in the place of sinners, in the stead of sinners. He stood the just for or in the place of the unjust, that he might bring us to God. He came into the world to reconcile the world unto God, and this he did and made peace for man with God by the blood of his cross. The disciples didn't understand this mission. They thought he came as a king, and to this end was he born, but Israel rejected him as her king. And unknown to the disciples, and unknown to the prophets of old, in the wisdom of God, there was the mystery of the church. For God foreseen the rejection of Christ by the nation of Israel, had planned in the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus to make his soul an offering for sin 
and to make salvation available to the Gentiles. So the disciples, not understanding this, questioned him before he returned to heaven as to what time he would establish the kingdom that belonged to Israel. He brushed the question aside, saying that there were times and seasons reserved to his father, and that his knowledge would be given him in due time. And then he led them out to the Mount of Olives, raised his hands in blessing, and was taken up into heaven. Two heavenly messengers appeared to the men from Galilee and testified to them at the ascension. They promised that this same Jesus who was taken up into heaven from them would so come again in like manner as they had seen him go into heaven. Then they saw him no more. Stephen saw him as he was being stoned to death and heaven was opened and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand. Paul saw him later when he was caught up in the paradise, the third heaven, and heard those unspeakable things not lawful for a man to utter. John saw him while on the Isle of Patmos and caught up in the spirit into heaven itself. But generally speaking, he has not been seen since. And he has left with us one glorious promise, that there will be a time and there is a time already foreknown of God when this same Jesus will return to this earth from heaven. He will come in like manner as the disciples saw him go. He will come in his own body now glorified. His coming will be bodily and visible, physical, real, our eyes shall see him, and at last our hands shall handle him, as John spoke, and we shall be brought into the presence of the Lord Jesus by this mysterious appearance of the Lord from heaven. Now, this is described in the Bible as a mystery. A mystery because the world does not understand it, nor would they believe it if they knew about it. And it is a mystery revealed to the church. Now, I must again define the word church, because when we think of church, we think of a building, or we think of an organization, or we think of a denomination, or a religious sect, or cult, or movement. But the word church in the Bible is a word which simply means <clears throat> a called out assembly. It speaks of a group of people called out of their association with the world by the gospel of Jesus Christ. The church is composed of every man, every woman, every boy and every girl on the face of this earth who have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior, their substitute, who have rested in his shed blood and his finished work, who know that their sins are forgiven them for Christ's sake, who know that their righteousness is Christ himself. The church is composed of all those who are sinners saved by grace. Now Jesus is coming for this church because he has a mission to the world itself. That mission is one of judgment. God has committed all judgment to the Son. And God will bring this earth into account for the crucifixion of his Son. Jesus is coming from heaven, according to the Old Testament prophets, to tread the winepress of the fierceness and the wrath of Almighty God. He is coming to deal with this civilization. He is coming to set this world in order, to reign in his own blessed way upon this earth for a thousand years, to establish the kingdom which was promised to David, and to do God's will on earth as it is now being done in heaven. Before he can thus deal with the world in judgment, 
he must remove the church. He must take her out of the way because she is his bride. He must take her unto himself because she has been saved from wrath, not appointed to it. She must be delivered to a safe place before he brings this winepress of God's wrath upon the earth. And so he is promised to the church and given to the church a blessed hope. <clears throat> I was reading yesterday in the paper a religious editorial on the future of the church in the next 25 years, the professing church, that is, they were talking about, and they all agreed that there are hard times ahead. And uh, one Methodist bishop deplored the fact that the gospel was not being preached anyplace anymore, and it looked like they were going to have to overhaul all of their theology in order to keep the church out of trouble in the next 25 years and to bring to pass more unity, which is what they all want. Now, unity and union are two different things. They speak of unity, but union is what they want. And union, as I have told you before, is when you tie a cat and dog's tail together. That may make them fastened together, but it doesn't make them one. Unity is what the true church knows. All who are saved know the oneness that there is in Jesus Christ. Religious organizations seek to have union, and they predict in the next 25 years there will be union, but there will be hard and difficult times ahead. Well, I can tell you what the history of the true church will be and what the future of it is. It is to be caught away with Jesus, to be lifted out of this present civilization without any previous warning. To be removed from the face of the earth mysteriously, suddenly, that Jesus might return in glory and deal with the world in judgment. Now, I didn't write the Bible. I'm only reporting what it says. I didn't think this up. I'm just giving it to you as God gave it in his word. If it stretches your imagination, then you will be forced to receive God's word by faith, which is the whole idea. We must simply believe God when he tells us that at any moment the Lord Jesus Christ himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with a trump of God, and that when he does, the dead in Christ will rise first, and we who are alive and remain unto his coming, the survivors, the leftovers, We'll be caught up together with those sleeping saints to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. History's greatest mystery will be the rapture. It will be a sudden disappearance of thousands of people from the face of the earth. There will be no human explanation. There will be no warning. There will not be a shred of evidence left. For once the church is raptured, the Holy Spirit's role or his ministry on earth will be an entirely different ministry. He will not be here to explain the rapture to anyone. He will be here to continue in his ministry of conviction and preparing the world for judgment. But when the church mysteriously disappears, every true believer in the Lord Jesus Christ will be gone. It will not be some denomination that is raptured or removed. It will not be some particular cult, not some religious group. It will be believers from all over the earth, from every nation, every tribe, every tongue, and every people. Wherever there is a man, woman, boy, or girl who has rested in his heart for salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, he will go up in the air to meet Jesus. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. I was thinking how, in essence, this has already happened at the resurrection of the Lord Jesus as a little example of what the rapture will be like. If you'll read about that in Matthew 27, you will remember that at the cross of Calvary, when Jesus died, the veil in the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. And there was something terrible happened at that time, an earthquake. 
wherein the earth trembled and the rocks were rent and the graves were opened. And it says that the bodies of some of the saints which slept arose and they appeared in the holy city to many. That is, that some of the saints that had been dead for years experienced a bodily resurrection after the resurrection of Jesus. The graves were literally opened, their bodies literally arose, and they possessed them again, and they appeared in the holy city and walked around, and men saw them, and obviously recognized them, or the writer of that story could never have known who they were, and he said they were the saints who had fallen asleep. And that was a very minor happening. Think what it will be when Jesus comes in the air for his church, and the graves which hold the bodies of the sleeping saints are opened, and the bodies disappear, and this time, instead of appearing in Jerusalem, they will appear in the true holy city in the presence of God, which is referred to as the Lamb's Bride, that holy city, that new Jerusalem, which belongs to us and belongs to Jesus. The living will be caught up together with the sleeping saints to meet the Lord in the air. The word together intrigues me in this passage because I think of the togetherness of believers now and I think what it's going to be in that day. Do you realize that this will be the first time that the entire church has ever been gathered together? I don't know whether you realize this or not, but since the scriptures teach it, we know it from experience, that all who are saved belong to the body of Christ, which is the church. The church is likened unto a human body. Paul says that we are the members of that body. And it says we are all joined to the head of that body, who is Christ. And we are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. And he speaks of the entire group of Christians, wherever they are in the world, as being joined in such a living relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ that he explains it as a body is joined to the head. He said, when one sorrows, they all sorrow. When one is joyful, they are all joyful. This is the way we know that we're in the body. What moves the body moves us. What touches the body touches us. And every time we meet in an assembly, we are just a part of that body. But sensing the oneness of that body, if there's a single one missing, there's something missing in that assembly. Now, I'm glad if anyone shows up. I'm happy if two are here or three. But if someone's missing, there's something missing from the fullness of our fellowship. Each one of you in the body contributes something of Christ to the rest of us. You may just come and sit on these chairs, and you may imagine that you contribute nothing, but you do. Each one of you are united to the Lord Jesus Christ by his death, burial, and resurrection. Each one of you have something of him. If you make no contribution greater than a needy heart, you've contributed the most wonderful thing you can contribute to this assembly. Do you realize that if you bring your needy heart to this meeting this morning, that the Holy Spirit seeing that needy heart and knowing it opens the word and opens Christ to that needy heart. And as that needy heart has its needs met, the needs of the body are met through that same supply. So that if you keep your needy heart at home, you've deprived the assembly of some precious thing that the Holy Spirit might otherwise have given. I sense this, I guess, more keenly than you do. For many, many times in thinking of the assembly before I come, in praying about the message, in studying God's word, I see certain portions that I'm sure will be precious to certain persons. Your faces come before me. 
And I think, oh, what a blessing that will be to brother so-and-so. Or, oh, how this will thrill sister so-and-so. Or how this will meet his needs or her needs or their needs. And then I come and you're not here. And there is something lacking in that message for me. Something is gone that I had intended to be blessed in. Something that I felt sure the Holy Spirit wanted to share with all of us, for he wanted to share it with you. And you weren't here. And so we were all deprived of his blessing. So there's never assembly when our joy is full. For our joy is tied up with the joy of all the saints. And there is something lacking in every family gathering, I'm sure. And this is a family gathering of the family of God. But in the rapture, it will be the first time that the joy of the saints will be full. It is the first time that they will sense no lack in their fellowship with Jesus. It is the first time when they will look about them and see the face of every brother, every sister in the whole family of God. It will be the first time that the family of God will be gathered together in a whole assembly. And the thoughts of that are a thrill to my soul. For in that day, our love for the Lord Jesus Christ will be perfect and full, and our love for one another will be perfect and full. And what joy we will know when we look about and see every believer in the body of Christ. Now, most of the believers I know by faith. I've only been privileged to know a few down here. But think of the thousands who know and love our Lord Jesus Christ. And whenever you meet a believer, someone who really knows and loves Jesus, you're not with them 30 seconds until you feel as though you've known them for all eternity. For you have known them for all eternity. And you've been in him since before the foundation of the world. Think what it will be in that day when we see each other and know each other in the body of Christ. I think of Paul. As I've told you before, I've spent more time with Paul than any other believer that I know of in the body of Christ. I've poured over the 13 letters that he left for us Christians today. And you know when someone's absent from you and all you have are his letters, you just read them over and over and over again, don't you? And you just keep on reading them and read between the lines and interpret what he says. Because it's the only means of fellowship you have is just that communication that came direct from him. And so Paul left us with these 13 wonderful and precious letters, sharing with us what he knows of Jesus. And most of everything that I know about the Lord Jesus I learned through Paul. And I've poured over these letters and poured over them, read between the lines, sensed his love of Christ, shared his joy, entered into his fellowship. What will it be like when I see him face to face? And in the presence of Jesus, I'll look about and say, there's Paul, and there's Peter, and there's Stephen, and there's John, the beloved disciple. I want to see that jailer at Philippi. I'd like to see Lydia. She would be a miracle of grace. Any woman can get saved out of the middle of a prayer meeting has to be a miracle of grace. That demon-possessed young girl that followed Paul about in Philippi will be there. The Ethiopian eunuch who had a hungry heart to know about Jesus. That professional soldier at Caesarea whose name was Cornelius who longed for truth from God will be there rejoicing in Jesus. We will know them every one. And we will hear from their lips throughout eternity their own stories. For the saints are gathered, we read in the book of Revelation about Jesus, and they're, they're singing unto him. Now the general theme they sing about is, Unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and made us kings and priests unto God and his Father forever. But I'm sure that each one of us will have a special verse to sing. 
And that verse will be about our own redemption, about the grace that reached us where we were and brought us where we now find ourselves, and all of it centered in the lovely person of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word together means a lot to me in this passage. Not only do I long for the togetherness of all the saints, our loved ones, our friends who are in Jesus will be there, and not a single loved one will be missing. For the only family we shall know in that hour will be the family of God. The only brothers, the only sisters we have ever known will be those brothers and sisters who have been washed in Jesus' blood. Our joy will lack nothing. It will be full. Our fellowship will be real and perfect. We will not only see each other as we really are, we are going to meet the Lord, the Lord Jesus, in the air. Now the word meet is from a Greek root which means to encounter, and that word is defined as a face-to-face -face interview. When the rapture takes place and Jesus calls his people to meet him in the air, the first thing that we will do is have a face-to-face -face encounter, a face-to-face -face interview with Jesus. I'd like for you to turn to the fourth chapter of Revelation, for there is a picture of the rapture in this chapter, at beginning at verse 1. John writes his experience on the Isle of Patmos, and he says, After this I looked. And behold, a door was opened in heaven. Now, who said, I am the door? Well, Jesus said, I am the door, and he's the door to heaven. And I'm sure that this is the door that John saw open. And the first voice which I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately, and that reminds me of Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 15, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, immediately I was in the Spirit, that's the way we'll go, thank the Lord, wouldn't it be awful to be raptured in the flesh? <laughs> immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne, and he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone. And there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight, like unto an emerald. Now read these three verses carefully, and I think you'll find a picture of the rapture. John had been looking at the letters to the seven churches, and later we'll get into that. But they are prophetic pictures of church history. And he saw the pro professing church moving forward in history to a time of apostasy, a time of lukewarmness, a time when the professing church would be saying they were rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, a time when they had rejected Christ and he was outside the professing church saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. And that's the time we're living in now, a time when the professing church has shut the Lord Jesus out, a time when they are rich and increased in goods and have need of nothing, and they have no need of him. And it was after this took place that John looked and he saw a door in heaven opened, and he heard the shout of the rapture, and it was, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately, in a moment, the twinkling of an eye, caught up in the Spirit, he found himself standing before the throne of God. Here is a literal picture of the rapture. What then did John describe first? What did he see first, and what captured his attention first? It was not the throne, and it was not the wonders of heaven about him. It was not those living creatures who were on both sides crying out, Holy, holy, 
holy Lord God Almighty, nor was it the seraph or the cherubim or the hundred million angels he describes later on, nor was it the great city whose streets were pure gold and whose wall was garnished with precious stones and each of his twelve gates were of a single pearl, nor was it the water of the river of life nor the fruit of the tree of life. That which captured John's attention first, and that which he saw and beheld and described was the one who sat upon that throne. For the one who sat upon that throne is the Lord Jesus Christ. God is a spirit and no man has seen him at any time. And no man will ever see him save in the face of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it was the, the Lord Jesus on his throne that fascinated John. And he gave a description which I don't understand. But I tell you, if you looked upon a sight such as that, what words would you choose? How could you describe what John saw in the face of Jesus? He saw him. He says it's the one who sat on that throne, who was to look upon like a jasper and a sardon stone. Now the jasper is perfectly clear and the sardon stone is blood red. And he saw something in Jesus that brought these two precious stones to his memory. It was something that was crimson about him that he saw and something that was clear as a crystal that he saw also. And I am at a loss to tell you what it was. I have my ideas as to what he saw that was crimson. He saw the precious blood which he shed. He saw the Lord Jesus Christ at the throne. It was at the throne of God. And the book of Hebrews says that at the throne of God is the mercy seat. And upon that mercy seat, the Lord Jesus sprinkled his own precious blood to obtain that eternal redemption for us. But as John stands there and looks upon Jesus, there is something else revealed to him. It is a rainbow. And the rainbow is round about the throne. That is, it completely encircles the throne. Now, you've never seen a round rainbow. You have never seen a perfect rainbow, the whole circle. All you've ever seen is half from horizon to horizon, but you have never seen a rainbow that circled round about as this rainbow did. And in color or in sight, it was like unto an emerald. What will it be like when we see Jesus? Let us talk about John for just a moment. John was a, a man like me, like you, like all of us. He had flesh and blood and bone. And he was born with Adam's depraved nature, just like I was, and like you. But John came to know and to love our Lord Jesus Christ. And he had such an intimate relationship to Jesus that while he was on earth, he was called the beloved disciple. And he was referred to in the New Testament as that disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, he loved all of his disciples, but there was something about this love of Jesus for John that the Holy Spirit calls attention to. He was nearest to Jesus of all the disciples. Though Peter was the spokesman of the disciples, John was the nearest because John loved Jesus. He lay upon his bosom at the Last Supper. Now, you know, in the Eastern custom was to eat reclining. And apparently at the Last Supper, as they reclined upon the couches, John was nearest to the breast of Jesus, where he could just turn over and his head would fall naturally upon the bosom of the Lord. And it was John, while in that intimate relationship to Jesus, who asked the question, Lord, who is it? When he spoke of one who would betray him. And I've always thought that it was into John's ear that he whispered, the one with whom I dip the sop. 
And so I think it was John who alone knew the identity of the betrayer of the Lord. He had such a wonderful and intimate and personal and loving relationship with Jesus that while hanging on the cross of Calvary, Jesus committed to John the only earthly possession that he left behind for man, and that was his own precious mother. And he committed her to John, which signifies to me that there was a special relationship between Jesus and John. He said to John, Behold thy mother. And he said to Mary, pointing to John, Behold thy son. Now why are you telling us all of this? Well, because I want you to see what kind of a relationship John had with Jesus, and then I want to describe to you what happened while he was on the Isle of Patmos. While he was on the Isle of Patmos, years later, exiled for his testimony for Jesus, longing for the coming of the Lord, for he closed this wonderful book, praying, Even so come, Lord Jesus. Here he was, an aged man now, on this little rocky island out in the Aegean Sea, exiled, far from home, lonely, homesick for heaven, looking for Jesus. Suddenly, while on the Lord's day, in the Spirit, he hears this voice. It's like a great trumpet. And he turns to see who it is. And he sees Jesus. Because his feet were as burnished brass. His eyes were like coals of fire. His hair as white as wool. Vivid description. But the implications of that description are plain. He saw Jesus as he had never seen him before, though he saw him transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration. But he sees him now in the full Shekinah glory of the eternal God. And he sees him clothed in the garments of his high priestly office, that office which is after the order of Melchizedek. He sees him as the priest of heaven, at the right hand of God, able to save to the uttermost all who come to God by him. And the sight of seeing Jesus in this manner was so startling to John that he fell down at the feet of Jesus, trembling with fear. Like a dead man, he lay at his feet, trembling, afraid to even look up. Yet John was Jesus' friend. He was his beloved disciple. Yet the sight of him in all of his eternal glory, in all of the majesty as the Son of God, was enough to put fear into the heart of John until he heard, he heard Jesus say, Fear not. Don't be afraid, John. I am the one who is dead, and I am alive forevermore, and I have in my hands the keys of death and hell. Now this explains why the rainbow is there. Because John, in his first epistle, says that when Jesus comes, we are going to see him as he really is. See what that means? We're not going to look upon the Nazarene, oh no, the carpenter's son. We're not going to look upon some lowly prophet. We are going to look upon the face of God in Jesus Christ. We are going to look into the unapproachable light, which is the true light of heaven and earth both. We are going to look and stand in the very presence of the omnipotent God. How shall we be able to stand in that day? It seems to me that standing in the very presence of God, looking upon him as he really is, would bring fear to the heart of any man. Ah, and we would be afraid were it not for that rainbow. Around about the throne is a perfect rainbow. And the rainbow has a meaning. And God's Word gives the meaning to that rainbow. In the ninth chapter of Genesis, we have the origin of the rainbow. God had promised destruction to man because of his sin. He said that the imagination of man's heart was continually evil. He promised to visit the earth in judgment. He promised to deal with man because of his sin. 
and he promised that none would escape save those who were saved by grace through faith in the ark which he provided, a type of Christ. Noah and his family found grace in the eyes of the Lord and were shut up in that ark. After they were shut up in that ark, God did destroy Noah's civilization. Every living thing was destroyed. Death was everywhere. Floating upon the face of that water which covered the entire earth was the debris of Noah's civilization, littered with the bodies of the dead. All was death outside that ark. And I have an idea it was not a very pleasant sight. A sight Noah will never forget. A sight Noah will always remember. A sight Noah will tell his children about. But when they came from the ark, God said to Noah, I have entered into a covenant. This covenant is between me and the earth. And I covenant with the earth that I will never again destroy the earth with water as I have done now. And to prove to you that I will remember my covenant, behold, I have placed in the sky a bow. And Noah looked, and there was the rainbow reaching from horizon to horizon. And he said, whenever you see that bow, it is a token between me and you. When you look into that bow, know that I will see that bow and remember my covenant, and I will never again destroy man with the floods of water as I have now done. And then he went on to impress upon Noah that this bow would be a token between him and God and that their eyes would meet in that bow in an eternal remembrance of the covenant he made. The bow was what removed Noah's fear. I have an idea that after the flood, every time it thundered and lightning, Noah got shook up. <laughs> or every time it began to rain, I expect he began to get nervous. But every time he looked up and saw the bow, he was at peace. For it was the reminder that God would remember his covenant. And he had the pledged word of God that judgment would never strike again. That's the spiritual meaning of that bow that reaches round about that throne. Not a half a bow, a whole perfect complete bow. For the moment we see God as he really is in the face of Jesus Christ. We're going to need a reassurance at that moment that judgment will never visit us. What will I see in that blessed bow around him? I will see the promise of God to remember his covenant. What covenant was it? It was the covenant of Calvary, where he entered into agreement between himself and earth by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he would pardon, forgive, and save forever those who rested in that blood. And the great bow about his throne today is his return, eternal token that the blood of Calvary shall never lose its power. When we look upon Jesus and see that round about him is the bow of God, his token that he will never forget the Calvary covenant, we will remember his words. There is now therefore no judgment no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. We will remember the words of Jesus, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my words and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall never come into judgment, but is passed from death unto life. And when we stand before that eternal throne, I'm sure that the words of Romans 8.34 will be brought vividly to our mind. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is Christ who died, yea, rather that is risen again, and now is at the right hand of God making intercession for us. It is God who justifies. None can lay any charge to his elect, for there is the token of his covenant, and there is the bow of his promise. 
And here are we standing before him in his presence, without spot and without wrinkle and without blemish, and without any such thing, just as he promised he would do. And I'm sure that we will cry out, and our cry will be unto the faithful God who loved us. Unto the eternal faithful God who begun a good work in us and who has performed it until the day of Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power and the dominion forever and ever. I don't know what else it will be like when we see Jesus, but I know this. There will be no disappointment. Now, you know, you hear about people and you don't get to meet them and you get to think about what they look like and then sometimes you see them and you're disappointed. Remember I told you a fellow flew in from Tulsa, Oklahoma and wanted to meet me and I met him at the restaurant. When I came in he said, well, I guess we're all wrong. We've been sitting here deciding what you look like and we decided you'd be fat and short and 70. Now I don't know, I guess he was disappointed. He thought I would look better fat, short and 70 than the way I looked. But there will be no disappointment when we see Jesus. He will be all that we had hoped he would be, and more besides. None of us have ever been able to comprehend him. And the Holy Spirit, you will notice, has very carefully in the Word of God kept us from forming any mental image of Jesus. What we know of him is spiritual. What we love of him is spiritual. We have never looked upon his blessed face, and that will be the thrill of eternity, is to see him whom our soul loves and find that there is not a single disappointment in all of our hopes, desires, and longings that we have experienced in this life in regards to Jesus. Now this passage says, and we must close this passage this morning, that this meeting will take place in the air. I'm never content to just read things like that. I want to know where the air is. <laughs> I may, may be the wrong air, and I may not be thinking of the right place. So doing a little investigation, I learned this. There are three words in the Greek language which are used many times in the New Testament to describe that area which is above the earth. One of these words is simply the word air or atmosphere, that which is immediately above us. The second word simply means stratosphere, which is beyond the immediate atmosphere, up where the planets are and the stars and so forth. Then there is another word, Uranus, which means the third heaven or the very heaven of God where he is, which is beyond the stratosphere. Now, if you'll study the scriptures, there is a very definite geographical location of the throne of God given. Job said that it was beyond the empty place in the north. And I told you before that astronomers and astrologists, too, take note of the fact that there is definitely a vacant place in the northern sky where there are no galaxies of stars. And Job knew about this 3,400 years before Jesus was born, and he said that beyond that empty place in the sides of the north was the throne of God. So that's Uranus. Beneath him is the stratosphere where our astronauts are now traveling around. And beneath that is our atmosphere, or the immediate air, encircling the earth. Now, what word did the Holy Spirit use? Well, he used the word for atmosphere. The Lord himself shall descend from heaven. He's coming from Uranus, the third heaven where God is now. And he's descending to the air, not to the stratosphere, but into the air itself, into the immediate atmosphere about the earth. And I'm indebted to Dr. Weiss at the Moody Bible Institute for giving me a very definite location of the air. He says that he discovered once in some profane writings where a Greek was standing on Mount Olympus. And Mount Olympus is 6,403 feet high. And in describing what he saw, he looked up and he described the stratosphere. But he looked down and he described the atmosphere. So Dr. Weiss says that the atmosphere lay beneath 6,400 feet, according to the use of those words, and that the Holy Spirit is very careful in this passage to put the exact location 
of the rapture in the atmosphere about us, just off the surface of the earth. He will not touch earth at this time. He will later when he comes back in glory and his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. And it will rend in two with a mighty earthquake. But this time when he comes for his bride, it will just simply be into the air, into the atmosphere where he will shout. And we will be caught up. It has to do with Satan, who is the prince of the power of the what? The air, the atmosphere. That's his headquarters. That's his stomping ground. And into the very presence of Satan himself, Jesus will come to take away his bride. And so shall we ever, ever be with the Lord. We shall never be separated from him again. Wherever he goes, we will go. When he comes back to earth to bring judgment, we will come with him. When he goes to Jerusalem and builds the temple again and sits upon that throne like a king and a priest, we will reign with him. When he reigns over the earth for a thousand years, we will share his glory. When he returns to the new Jerusalem to take up his permanent abode, we will go with him. And wherever he goes, we will go. And whatever he does, we will share. Whatever he is, we will be made that. Whatever his reception, that will be ours. Whatever his destiny, that will be ours. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The word comfort means to encourage, to aid, to help, and to exhort. Now I ask you some questions and then I close. When you hear about the rapture, that at any moment the Lord Jesus may descend from heaven and we will be caught up in the presence of the Lord with all the saints of the church to be taken into glory with him and to stand before the throne and to see him as he really is and to share with him his destiny, does it encourage you? When you hear about the rapture, that at any moment, at any second, he may come to deliver us from this present earth, does it aid you? Does it help you? Does it exhort you? That is, does it encourage you to apply to your life this truth. Only the brethren are comforted. Unsaved religious professors find no comfort in the rapture. They find no encouragement in the rapture. They find no aid, no help, and no exhortation. They say of it, it's interesting, rather fantastic. I don't know what to think of it, but it doesn't comfort me. It doesn't help me. It doesn't encourage me. It doesn't aid me. As a woman said to me one time when I mentioned the rapture to her, she told me she was a Christian. And I thought, well, if she's a Christian, she'll surely love the blessed hope. And I said, well, wouldn't it be wonderful when Jesus comes and we'll see him? Oh! Don't say that. That scares me. Obviously, she was not comforted by the hope of his coming. Nor was she aided, helped, encouraged, or exhorted. She was made fearful by the thought of his presence. What would you think if I labored for an hour to tell you how much I was in love with my wife, and then after establishing this great love for my wife, I told you that she was in California and the thought of her coming home made me sick of my stomach. <laughs> this is the inconsistency of the professing church today. They talk about being Christians, which means, in essence, loving Jesus. And the thought of his coming back makes them sick at their stomachs. The brethren are comforted. And the only people in the world who will get anything out of the teaching of the rapture are believers. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. And the rapture will only mean as much to you as the words of Jesus mean to you. And the words of Jesus will only mean as much to you as Jesus means. You love Jesus, you love his word. 
And if you love Jesus and you love his word, you love the rapture because this is by the word of our Lord Jesus. And what is his word? His word is, I'm coming. I'm coming. And I'm coming for you. And I say, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. Let us pray. Our Father, we stand on Jordan's stormy banks and cast a wishful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where our possessions lie. And we realize that we are pilgrims and strangers in this present earth. <clears throat> our home is heaven. Our destiny to be like Jesus and to be with him. And the wonder of it all. You loved us. And you gave him for us. The wonder of it all is that the Holy Spirit has made us to understand this. And to love him because he first loved us. Oh, Father, we thank you for this blessed hope. May our hearts be encouraged and aided and comforted, helped and exhorted by this word this morning. And may we go away praying, even so come Lord Jesus. And may we hear his answer from heaven as John did that day. Behold, I come quickly. We leave this message in your hands to do in our hearts what pleases you. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Lord bless you.